Uh, I'm glad I came early uh, to watch all the stuff from today and to look at the exhibits and some of the talks. And I can't help but compare the equivalent to this event to what I had when I was uh, in college, uh, let's say 1964, my, as I was getting into my uh, senior year in college. If I look at everything that was displayed here and everything that's talked about, probably more than 90% of the technology that you guys talked about was totally unrecognizable 54 years ago. The word software came much later, right? And I did my senior project and I needed to do a simulation uh, to see if I could predict what my model airplane did when it flew with different amounts of differential aileron. I, I, I picked a real specific thing for my senior project. And I, had, I was plugging in wires into resistors and capacitors and running an analog computer. My calculator was a slide rule. How many here know how to run a slide rule? Well, that's, that's high, really, because my, my best engineer at scale looked at it puzzled. I actually flew mine to space, which is kind of cool. Um, I, uh, our expo was just about aeronautics. We hadn't started using the word astronautics yet. It was just aeronautics. Uh, the time period was halfway between when Gagarin and Alan Shepard flew to space and when Neil and Buzz landed on the moon. Now you can imagine what halfway between those were. <laughs> you know, we're looking for almost 200,000 people to, to build, to do Apollo. A lot of the rocketry was done by guys that did race cars. <laughs> and they're looking for young, the average age of those people is 27. The people that went to the moon used slide rules and they were 27 years old. Their computers were wires running through donuts that were magnets. Um, I'm going to talk quite a bit about space history because I, uh, what, we, what happened in the 60s is unbelievable to people that are working in the industry now. It, it doesn't seem possible. And looking back, you know, I went through it. I had this choice, do I, do I work on Apollo? Do I work on going to the moon or do I work on airplanes? You know, I picked airplanes for a number of reasons, but because uh, I was too late. Uh, but my senior project, I ended up winning the national award for the uh, design, college design for AIAA, Academy of Aeronautics and Astronauts. And uh, so I had to go to San Francisco to get this award. And I met somebody that became my hero when I was 12 years old. When I was 12 years old, uh, we went to adjacent town to some friends who had television. <laughs> we couldn't have it. We were Seventh-day Adventists, okay. <laughs> and I saw Walt Disney and Warner von Braun in 1955. I was 12. And he's got these models, and he's talking about how he's going to send hundreds of people to Mars. And I'm thinking, wow! And I'm, it, it's more wow than you would think because... In 1955, Mars was a hell of a lot more interesting place to go than it is now. <laughs> hey, we knew there were plants. We could see the colors change. You know, we, we didn't know whether the animals were intelligent or not. So that was really, you know, wouldn't that be cool? Hey, Magellan, in 1520, he thought he would find species that were similar to humans. He didn't know whether they were more advanced or less advanced than him. Now imagine if we had that kind of a challenge in front of us right now, how exciting it would be. We are living in super boring times as far as exploration goes because you send all these damn robots out, they land only in the desert and you know, they don't land in the forest or downtown and, and you know, it's, it, it doesn't seem interesting to go. 
But anyway, at that meeting in San Francisco, I got to meet Ron Braun. 1965, the guy who was this biggest hero of mine when I was 12. Uh, we went into a little cocktail party before we got our awards. He was getting one of any number of awards, and I was getting the first big award I ever had. And if I had no idea what Ron Brown looked like, I could walk into that room and spot who he was. He seemed much bigger than everybody else. He was eloquent, he was smart, and he was surrounded by rows of people that are looking up at him in awe. And you know, it's almost like, hey, this guy is not one of us. You know? So uh, later on, I got to meet the, what's called the old timers. Uh, in the late 90s, there were, there were still, a, well, there's still a couple of them still alive, but there were still about 12 of the paperclip folk who came to America uh, in 45 and 46 after the war. And I got a chance to, to become friends with some of those folk. In fact, I think you'll see one or two of them in the slides that I'm gonna show. So anyway, this, this was the big deal. The, the fact that I won that award, equivalent to whoever the winner is here probably, but on a national basis, let me meet Von Braun and it totally changed uh, my outlook for everything that I did beyond that. To think that I made a decision that a small team working covertly, not working with NASA, not letting NASA know what we were doing. We, our program, people don't know this usually, but our program was three and a half years old. We did a manned space program, including the launch airplane, developing the rocket, rocket test, uh, all the flight tests and everything. We, we made three space flights in 2004. Excuse me, we made three of the world's five space flights in 2004. And we were just a little, a little group. Our program for the first two of those three and a half years was covert. We didn't, we didn't want help. We didn't have time to deal with it, so we didn't let anybody know what we were doing. <laughs> and we thought one of those X Prize participants might be, a, a, might be some competition. We didn't want them to know what we were doing. So anyway, uh, I'm gonna get on here. Some of this presentation, uh, I've already thrown out a few slides. Some of this I'm gonna kind of flash card through. And the main reason, because I'm looking at your eyes and realizing you guys are gonna be really good for Q&A. You're gonna ask some cool questions and we'll probably have more fun in Q&A than I will in the talk. So excuse me if I just might skip through a whole bunch of them just so that we have more time for Q&A. I was seven day Adventist. I couldn't, uh, couldn't go to football games. The girls couldn't wear lipstick. Uh, couldn't go out uh, uh, for sports. We couldn't have television. We didn't go to movies. So I found something that I could do that was, that was competitive because I couldn't be a football star. And I did model airplanes. And uh, that's, I, I focused on that almost solely. Uh, just building model airplanes, all of them new things, none of these are from kits and so on, and trying to win trophies. And so I started at a relatively young age of focusing on winning. You know, sometimes nowadays, I'm sure it doesn't happen here, but schools say, oh, well, winning is bad, everybody wins, right? Well, no. <laughs> uh, the most rewarding parts of my childhood down here was when I'd enter one of these models, like down here where I flew into Dallas Nationals, uh, I was competing against adults in a lot of those events. And when I would beat the adults, uh, that fired me up like you would not believe. You know? And that sort of thing gave me courage to try to do things that didn't seem normal or possible. Uh, well, I was supposed to say that during this, okay. 
I like to talk about the important part of a, of, of a person's development is when he's between the age of like three and 14. Right there, what he sees, yeah, you know, you know, you're almost too old, aren't you? Yeah, okay. I'm talking to the kid that did the, uh, did the uh, ability app. Um, what, uh, what, you, what you see out, uh, happening around you when you're that age has a lot to do whether in the future you'll have the courage to try something way out there. In other words, a lot of progress that happens when you're that age means that you'll be bored with what the normal when you're an adult and you can find some billionaire to give you money. You can, you'll, you'll, you'll try to do things that are further out there. Uh, during that period, okay, the black line here is the fastest that humans had, had, had flown, okay? Down at the bottom, 1940, 19, my, my three to 14 is that little segment right there. The red one is the, is the speed, the fastest speed of the highest performance military airplane. And the blue line is how fast you can go if you buy a ticket and fly in the airlines, okay? And you can see that period of time for me, everything made a real big jump. And I think that had a lot to do uh, with, with what I ended up trying to do later on. Okay, I get with that, let's see. Oh yeah, 22 years after I graduated, I got back, I got invited to Cal Poly at San Luis Obispo, and they gave me their first honorary doctorate. Wow, a degree with no homework. <laughs> That's really cool. And I gave the commencement address. And then 39 years later, I got the Von Braun Trophy, which I covet as one of the, the most Im, Im, important achievements. By the way, a doctorate, a lot, a lot of people say, well, you've got a doctorate. You know, that's, that's not a real degree. Well, an earned doctorate is given to you in the hopes that someday you'll do something great. An honorary doctorate is given to you because you already have. <laughs> I heard somebody say that, so I, I'm not embarrassed by the fact that I don't have a master's degree, that I, but I have seven doctorates. <laughs> okay, I picked my lowest paying job out of college, $7,070 a year, which I thought was big money. I did... Uh, flight test of Air Force airplanes, and I worked for the government. I was a flight test um, uh, GS government employee. And uh, I really had a ball. I, probably, I, I thought I had the best job in the Air Force for a civilian. I didn't get to shoot at bad guys, but I got to test their airplanes. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, testing the airplanes is the right thing to do if you want to be an airplane designer. Test them and see what their faults are and get to work on, what do we got there, eight different projects in seven years. You don't get that kind of experience if you go to work for Boeing and say, hey, I'm a new grad with an aero degree. I want to design things, okay? <laughs> well, you're not going to design an airplane. You're going to design part of a door, right? <laughs> but I, after doing this with, with uh, uh, flight testing airplanes, I mean, brand new airplanes, some really neat stuff, uh, I, I, as a designer, I got out there with the courage to go ahead and, and design airplanes, and there's no way I was going to design a door. Started my first airplane uh, when I was working at Edwards. Uh, I founded a business so I could go to work as an entrepreneur, and essentially what we did for our income is we'd sell plans so that people could build my design airplanes in their garages. And I ended up selling 14,000 sets of plans. Uh, anybody who starts building a home-built airplane, only about 10% of them ever fly it. So, you know, there's that, there's that big, uh, there's that big uh, uh, discriminator there. Later, when I ran a business 
scale composites. If I'd interview people, and he's actually built and flew here in a home-built airplane, I've got a, I've got a 10 to 1 uh, cut right there, just without asking him a question. Uh, these are the projects that, that RAF, Rutan Aircraft Factory, did. And I, I shut down the business in 1985 because I was running two businesses, and I, and I picked the one without the high product liability. <laughs> They were based on fun. Uh, and you have a hell of a lot of fun when you show up at the Oshkosh show and you sit under the wing and you have a discussion with people that flew in and are building the, an airplane that you designed. And this is the best kind of interface for, for uh, you know, we, there's no internet then, of course, but it was a wonderful interface, face-to-face -face, uh, support that you could, no, nobody would do this anymore because they just throw everything on a website. But this was a real personal thing and working with people that were having a lot of fun. A little picture of when Voyager uh, came to uh, Oshkosh before it did the world flight. Uh, we set a goal because it seemed like a, a neat thing to do and because I made a few little calculations, nothing really complex, no CFD, just some back of the envelope estimates, because I, I had, by that time, I had designed, uh, oh, maybe a quarter of the airplanes that I ended up uh, building, uh, research airplanes. And I said, I think it's possible to take off full of gas, fly around all the way around the world, and land without refueling. Uh, now, that's a crazy thing to say, because the longest flight that ever had been made was halfway around the world. Now, absolute world records, not little individual ones, weight class and whatever, but absolute records like maximum speed, maximum altitude, maximum range. All of these records are generally beat by a few percent. I had to double it for Voyager. And we don't have time to tell that story, but uh, it's gonna be one of the more interesting chapters in the, in the book I'll put out for free download on my website. I founded a new company then in 82, and we didn't work with the public at all with this company. Our customers initially were, were people like Beechcraft, you know, we did the Starship, and, and uh, uh, we did a lot of the kind of work that we can't talk about. And we did work for billionaires. Uh, but anyway, this gives you an idea how big the company was. It wasn't, it wasn't a whole large number of people. This is chronology starting down at the bottom here, 1983, when we uh, built our first airplane, out to when I retired. These are chronological uh, snapshot of the major manned airplane, manned research airplanes. These aren't. This isn't a new research airplane because it's a, it's a Model B of a Model A. If you look at all these, they're all totally different. We managed in the 80s and 90s to fly a first flight of a new type on an average of once every eight months. And people in the aviation industry go to work for Boeing or, or Cessna, they might do two airplanes in a career. So this was fun. I got to show this because it's one of my favorite pictures, but it's the first airplane we did at Scale Composite, the Starship, and we carefully aligned up the air-to-air -air photograph so it's connected to the last airplane that I did before I retired, the White Knight II and, and the thing we did for Branch and Spaceship II. Okay, now we're going to get into a little bit of lecture, and I'm talking to you as a leader, maybe a project engineer, or as a manager, or as somebody who's creative and smart. And I'm giving you some lessons here that I learned uh, for, oh, 50 years of, of development of research airplanes. And that is, look at what's happened before in terms of how big it is and how important it was and how quickly it was done 
learn those examples and then challenge your team to do what they think is not possible. And JFK got up in uh, uh, 21 days after the Alan Shepard suborbital flight and he says, all right, guys, America's going to put a man on the moon, bring him back safely before 1970. And somebody says, it's only nine years, <laughs> right? And we didn't know how to navigate to the moon. We didn't have the computers. We didn't, we didn't have anything, really, essentially. We certainly didn't have a big rocket. And uh, of course, that seemed silly. Uh, but the challenge uh, seemed impossible, but, but uh, it, it met the definition of research. Research is a project that you attempt to do, whether you succeed or not. If you fail or whether you succeed, that project, if at least half of the people look at it, will say, impossible, can't do it. If the majority of people say, well, yeah, that can be done, you're not doing research at all. You're doing development. Okay, it's really important. A lot of people say R&D like it's one word. They're totally different. When JFK said that, that we're going to go to the moon and come back alive before 1970, Everybody's jumping up and down. Hey, multi-year funding, right? <laughs> Congress doesn't cut us off every September. That'd be great. Uh, and everybody said, oh, yeah, we can do this. Okay, if you grab any of them at any level, from a floor sweep to a top manager, and put them in a room, close the door, and say, listen, I'm not going to say anything about this. I'm just taking a survey, but how much? what's your net worth? And the person tells you what he's worth said, would you bet everything that you own that we're actually going to do that <laughs> and do it before 1970? Okay, you get a minority, not a majority. By definition, the whole Apollo thing was a research program because the majority thought it was impossible. <clears throat> I'll talk a little about that wonderful time period, 61 to 73. Uh, we did phenomenal things. We challenged phenomenal things because we lost. Uh, we lost on the first satellite in orbit. Sputnik, even though von Braun had the hardware to launch something to orbit, <laughs> they wouldn't let him fly it. We lost on the first astronaut because Gagarin got it instead of Alan Shepard. And again, von Braun had the hardware. <laughs> they wouldn't let him fly it. Okay, if we'd have flown one less monkey on Redstone Mercury, we'd have beat Gagarin. Just one less monkey, okay? So the, these programs technically were ties, but to the world, it said Russia's not a third world technology company. They are better than you. And that pissed off JFK. <laughs> and, and I know that he was thinking, I got to make America great. Because he went to von Braun and, about, and he lined up about six or eight people and said, OK, you guys tell me what we can do so that the world knows that we're better than these commies. That was their challenge. And they huddled and said, well, we got a big problem here. Uh, America did something better than Russia, and it was real important, is that, is that we, we were able to make a small warhead, nuclear warhead, so we could bomb them with the little Atlas. But they were unsuccessful at making a small warhead. They had these huge nuclear bombs, so they had to build huge rockets. And they had the huge rockets, so they could tomorrow do a space station, right? <laughs> and, and we couldn't. Von Braun, had on the drawing board, he was building Saturn I, which was actually seven redstones all locked together. You see the ribs on it. 
He was planning to build a Saturn II, Saturn III, a Saturn IV, and then finally he'd get approval to build the Saturn V, something big enough that we could do a, a manned lunar mission. And he went back to the office after listening to, uh, uh, to the speech and said, guys, uh, we can't build a Saturn II or III or IV. We've got to go right to the V. But anyway, oh, I started to tell you about this group that says, what can we do uh, to beat the Russians at? And we had to go all the way out to something that, that really looked impossible, certainly impossible with what we knew, the, the lunar uh, manned flight. Uh, and so that was the goal then. And the decision was made because it was important to show that America is exceptional. And I'll tell you, I don't like to talk to people that don't think America is, is exceptional. I really don't. I've, I'm, life is too short uh, to have to even get into that debate. And I'm sorry, but that's where I came from. I, you know, I was a warfighter right out of college. I, I flight tested airplanes for the Vietnam War. And, uh, oh no, I'm not gonna get into politics. We had a rivalry cry to, to ride to recover our prestige. All of these things were done in a very short period of time. We took enormous courage by taking huge risks. Is everybody familiar with Apollo 8, where the guys are orbiting the moon and watching the Earth rise on Christmas Eve, reading from the Bible? Uh, how many of you here realize that that was the first time that people were ever launched on a Saturn V? Saturn V, this brand new huge rocket, it didn't fail on its unmanned two flights, but it shook things so bad it probably would have injured the crew. And they did some engineering analysis and said we probably got it fixed and we put three guys in it and sent them to, to orbit the moon 10 times. The first time people went on a Saturn V, we went to the friggin' moon. I mean, think about making a decision like that today, right? You gotta take horrible risks if you're gonna be exceptional and if you're gonna have breakthroughs. We made a decision that Apollo program would have lunar orbit rendezvous. In other words, we'd have to send something to the surface and it would have to rendezvous back to the capsule in lunar orbit. That decision was made real early in the program because we calculated you couldn't do it by going to the uh, landing on the moon and then taking off and coming straight back to the Earth unless you had something much bigger than a Saturn V. So somebody stuck their necks way out there and said, that's the way we're gonna do it. And Von Braun was pretty smart. He, he, wanted, he wanted a direct mission. He wanted to, to put two or three Saturn Vs in Earth orbit and, and build up the bigger thing that he would need to go to the moon. And you know, he thought it was too risky to do this lunar orbit rendezvous. And there was a meeting where the guy who had this lunar orbit rendezvous idea, Humboldt, and he gave up and he got up and, and told the physics about why this is the only way to do it. And Von Braun's team was there with their PowerPoint. No, they had just plastic slides. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after listening to Humboldt's talk, uh, the main presenter who worked for Braun Braun got up to present his uh, proposal and Braun Braun looked at him and said, sit down. Uh, it's, it's hard for me to say that, but he looked at him and said, sit down. He's right. This is what we're gonna do. And decisions were made like that. And if they weren't made by, like that, we might still look like a third world country. Okay, this is slide is incomplete, and I decided instead of showing you the answer, uh, this is your homework assignment. I make a claim 
that nine manned space launch systems, for example, the space launch system is the Vostok, right? And the space launch system is not the Mercury capsule, it's the Redstone. So the rocket system, right? Don't think about capsules. There were nine separate rocket launch systems that flew people to space in the 60s. In nine years, there were nine separate rocket systems that flew people to space. It's actually 10. The, the Russians like to count Vox Hod, even though only flew it once, and it looked just like that one. But anyway, uh, let's call it nine. As a homework assignment, name them chronologically. Okay? I have yet to find a NASA historian or a NASA administrator or groups of 1,500 NASA people, some of them are graybeards, and they couldn't name them. And I'm, I'm going to do something real unusual. You can use the internet. <laughs> Try uh, Bing or Google. Really helpful tools. I don't know if you guys ever. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, before I leave tomorrow, if you, can, uh, if you can lay those out and tell me chronological what the nine or 10 are, I'll, I'll, I'll figure some kind of prize for you. Okay, after 1970, for the next 48 years, 48 years, there were three new launch system that put people in space. Space Scuttle, 81. Space Shuttle, uh, Space Transportation System. Uh, very significant thing, but it never reached its goals, of course. Uh, the Senjiao Chinese in 2003, while well, we were getting ready to fly the third one, uh, Spaceship One. Only three in 48 years, and nine or 10 the first nine years. You might ask why? Hell, we, 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 we don't work with slide rules now. We should be able to do cool things. And I think we should be able to do cool things. I think we should be sending planetary robotic explorers every week, not just one or two uh, every two years. I really, really do. Could be because with miniaturization, I mean, you got a 4K camera on a $500 drone, for God's sakes. <laughs> We ought to be sending thousands of those out, out to Enceladus and, and Titan and, you know, looking at some cool stuff. Let's look at all 66 of the moons of, of uh, uh, Jupiter and look at them close up. It's not expensive now. Really isn't. With what Musk has done with reflying boosters and what we have done with sensors that are tiny weight now instead of things like a pickup truck, we should be able to do we should be able to be doing a lot of that. How many here were born before 1935? Okay, sir. Are you the only one? Anybody else? Anybody else? How old are you? Uh, 87. 87. You belong to a very special group because nobody born after 1935 has walked on the moon. Now, doesn't that piss the rest of you off? <laughs> We're within 12 years of a time when there will not be any living human being who's walked on the moon. What? We had a hell of a capability, and we threw it out the window to save money for something that actually hurt us. And we gave up. And we've gone through a whole lifetime of not going back. And what other technological breakthrough and new capability in transportation work that way? Not even close. OK, let's look at the first 10 years after Gagarin and Alan Shepard. Well, here's Alan Shepard, his suborbital flight, okay? The Redstone, by the way, was that big around. 
That's it. It's that big around. And it's set on a milk stool. You can see it taken off there. The right side of this is an illustration of the same guy, Alan Shepard, and he got to play golf on the moon. Less than 10 years later, from the first suborbital flight, he hit golf balls on the moon. And what have we done in the last 10 years? What have we done to challenge ourselves to take this wonderful new technology and computing and sensors and to use it for something exciting or exploration? 10 years later, he's hitting golf balls with a five iron on the moon. I'll tell you, hitting a golf ball on the moon is, is really cool compared. You know, you get something just a little bit smaller than the moon and you can launch a, a, a ball to orbit on the, on the moon. Of course, it'll come back and hit right where you hit it, but you gotta, you gotta step back a couple of meters. <laughs> okay, let's look at the next 10 years, 71 to 81. Well, we did a lot there, Skylab. This guy's in Skylab floating around. That is a much bigger room and a much funner space station than the ISS. The ISS is all these little uh, uh, science labs. You know, you, you've seen the videos, the tour of the ISS. I don't know why they let those out. It's the most boring thing in the world. You know, here's this guy floating around, and he can get stuck out there. And if he wants to, you've seen this video maybe, he can get going on the outside and use centrifugal force to give him traction and run around on the outside. That was a cooler thing to do than anything on ISS. That program was flown and operated in space four years after the go-ahead, and the go-ahead was after Apollo 11. There were uh, all of these planetary missions. Now, none, all of these were not successful, but these are the attempts that we did to explore planets in that 10-year time period, 4.6 of them per year. Let's look at the next 10 years, 81 to 91. Well, nothing happened, so let's look at 30 years. <laughs> the next 30 years from 81, there's a planetary mission. We only did two a year instead of five. Why? Wasn't that interesting things to do? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that uh, excite our children to get into STEM if we found out who, what, what, you know, what's down there in the oceans of Enceladus? You know? There were four main, uh, manned space flights in 1961. There were five in 2004, and I had to fly three of them. And I'm not proud of that. I'm embarrassed by that. OK, let's get into my space program, because people tend to like that. And you know, people used to always ask me, Bert, what's your favorite airplane that you've done? And I'd always say, the next one. <laughs> you know, because they don't know about it until it flies. So you know, it gets them all excited. I know, oh, the next one. But after, I have to admit that after doing Spaceship One, I always say Spaceship One. Uh, in terms of the coverage of our first non-government space flight on the world's newspapers being reported above the fold of the front page, this was the number two story of 2004. And if they hadn't have pulled Saddam Hussein out of his spider hole, it would have been the number one story of 2004. It, would, it turned out to be a much bigger deal than we thought it could be. And again, this was a tiny team that did it. The average staffing during the three and a half years was less than 40 people. We had one funding source. I had worked with Paul Allen on other things, uh, drones to, to give uh, uh, Internet coverage, you know, the last mile stuff. This is before fiber in the ground. So uh, I'd work with orbiting airplanes to, to, you know, give Internet to everybody in Los Angeles who had a dish like that pointing up. Uh, 
Then I found out he was a space geek because his, his parents took him to Apollo launches. <laughs> and uh, so when I got to the point where, where uh, I, in the next meeting, I says, uh, this is after I invented the feathered reentry. I said, Paul, you know, I think I can do this now. Uh, if I had my own money, I would, I would spend it on this. I'll tell you, that's an embarrassing question to ask any of these outfits that are, most of them are gone now, but they called them new space. They're out begging for money, but there's no way they'd spend their own money on it, right? But anyway, I told Paul, I, I, I would, I, if I had money, I'd do this. He put out his hand and shook it and said, let's do it. That little five minute conversation was all the extent of marketing that I did to have full funding for a manned space program. That's it. Didn't talk to anybody else. I didn't travel around begging because I've seen so many people beg and then they end up flying things that shouldn't be flown now so they can impress someone to get more money. So I, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to fall into that, uh, into that trap. Okay, what's the importance of technical breakthroughs, technical innovation? Why do we need breakthroughs? I think it's a key factor in the development of intelligence. The fact that we can look forward to having something for our species that's different and far better than what our children had, I don't think that exists in the animal world. I think it has, it's, it's one of the things I think is a key factor on why we're different is we can affect the future and we look forward to the future and we work hard for the future. Okay, the factors that drive, okay, survival. We have breakthroughs to survive. It might be a perceived threat, but a conquering adversary if we think we're gonna, we're, we're gonna be conquered, we'll develop something that's a breakthrough. McCready's aero environment company was failing. He looked at the prize for the Kramer Prize and he, did, and he successfully did a man-powered airplane to win the prize to have enough money to keep his business going. And now he's a billion dollar company. Environmental crisis. Even if, it's, even if it's false crisis, like the global warming thing, that fires us up to try to, to, to invent things that are, that are breakthroughs. If you're scared, of course, uh, embarrassment of perceived defeat, the Apollo program, but we accomplish, we, we go after breakthroughs when we're scared. And I think we also do it to have fun. When do, we, when do they occur? During or after crisis? Bad times. Not during tranquil, stable, good times, when our highest priority is everybody, everybody should be the same. Everybody should have the same meal. We do it when we're threatened. We didn't go to Mars in the 80s and 90s, which financially capability and technology, we, we could have done that with less risk than what it took in the 60s to go to the moon. <clears throat> we had some really bad stuff going on in the 60s and yet we still went to the moon. You gotta have confidence in nonsense to even have a chance to have a breakthrough. And the reason is, think of the biggest breakthrough technically that you can think of and you go back before it was considered a breakthrough and you'll probably conclude, well, that's nonsense. So the weird people end up having confidence in nonsense. Numbers, they're not the sensical people that go out and try. You can't have a breakthrough by putting any amount of money poured into it. The best example on that is the space shuttle program 
whose goal was to make it cheaper to put things in orbit. Okay. I believe that breakthroughs uh, have a lot to do with the working environment. The best example of that is a wonderful stuff that Kelly Johnson uh, uh, did at the Skunk Works in the 50s and 60s. And uh, I, I was honored to be able to meet Kelly once. And uh, he's, he's another enormous hero of mine. Okay, let's talk about managing innovators. The manager. And maybe the funder, you know, who, who's going to put the dollars in it. Their tasks are to set the goal, make sure that communication is happening, get the dollars, pick something that is impossible. You're not going to have a breakthrough unless you try something that's impossible. Reward the achievement. Let the innovator decide what risks to take. If you're on a team and you're going to have a breakthrough about, gee, how do we get to Mars, for example, and you look at a choice between two ways of doing it and one, and they're both risky, if you're a chicken, you take it to the boss and let him decide, right? Because you think, well, he's the boss, this is important, he's got to decide it. You're the one better qualified to decide it, not him, right? And if he picks the wrong thing, then you're screwed, right? So it is not the manager's job, it should not be his job to decide what risk to take. He should leave everybody alone and keep outsiders out. He should applaud the courage and expect multiple failures. And he should let them have fun. Okay, this, this is something written by a really a smart Frenchman. I'm going to let you read it. Or I'll read it. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood. Don't assign them tasks and work. But rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. Now think about that. The manager of a program to build a new ship, if he does that, he makes a material selection, right? How are you going to have a big breakthrough, like having an aluminum ship, if the manager says, go out and gather some wood? None of his business. He shouldn't make that decision. If he, sec if he selects all the tasks, where am I? <clears throat> oh, assigning tasks. If you assign people specific tasks as a manager, you take away their ability to be creative and find a better manufacturing process because you've already been given the task. You see the point I'm trying to make? Good enough. Five years after the Apollo landings, the United States was first in the world in putting out doctorates for science and engineering. Now we're on the third page. And I think it has a lot to do is that we didn't do anything interesting lately to get our kids excited about doing something great and going after uh, doctorates in science and maths or what's called STEM now. I think it's very important then to inspire the kids, this age group that I talked about. If you look at an age group of, uh, excuse me, look at a time period from 1908 to 1914. I picked this because 1908 is when, uh, when Wilbur Wright went to France with his airplane and he flew it in front of him. And he made more than one flight a day and he did figure eights. And Europe all of a sudden realized, well, shoot, 
we thought he had done Photoshop on that picture. <laughs> and they realized that this guy really can fly and we can't. We can make little hops that go straight. And, and right then, uh, there was a realization that these guys came out of a bicycle shop. At least Glenn Curtis had a motorcycle shop, much better engines, right, than a bicycle shop. And uh, the world, without the internet, concluded, I can do that. If these guys in a bicycle shop built and flew a powered airplane, I can do it too. Within four years, there were hundreds of airplanes types in 39 countries. Now think about doing that without the internet. I gave a talk to Airbus and it was in a building that in 1912 built 500 airplanes. And they didn't realize that this really works until Wilbur uh, brought his airplane four years earlier. What have we done in four years? Aircraft were invented by natural selection. Well, what does that mean? Survival of the fittest, right? There were tens of thousands of different ideas and designs for airplanes. Because there wasn't a book to design from, people just tried everything, right? And if an airplane wouldn't get off the ground, well, let's not build another one of those, right? And if an aircraft did get off the ground and immediately killed the pilot, let's not build another one of those. See, it's natural selections. When an airplane made a successful first flight, a new type of airplane in those days made a successful flight and landed, it had good flying qualities by definition. And the pilot, when he flew it, had zero time in type, right? Think about tens of thousands of new airplanes and everybody that's going to fly the first flight has zero time. Wilbur flew that first crash that only went 120 feet. They agreed that wasn't a flight that shows sustained powered flight, even though you read all the history books say, oh, gee, our wings are longer than the, you know, BS. Uh, the, the Wright brothers didn't decide that they had made that sustained powered flight until their fourth flight because they crashed on the first, second, and third uncontrollably. They flipped a coin for who's going to fly the first and he crashed and so they said, well, you take the second one. And by definition, he had zero time and type and Wilbur had what was it, T 10 seconds, something like that? Oh, well, if I get into right, it'll take too long. Okay, kids were inspired by what happened in this beautiful four-year time period. <clears throat> in 19, excuse me, 2003, 100th anniversary of the Wright Brothers flight, Aviation Week asked me to write down what my big impressions were on the first 100 years of aerospace who was the movers and shakers? What, what was the most impressive thing about this first 100 years? And to predict the second 100 years. <laughs> and of course, I didn't even touch the second thing. But I went out and I listed the people that I thought, to me, were the ones, the most important ones to advance aviation. And I, I, I luckily got to meet all but two of these people. And I found out later that every one of these guys was a little child during that wonderful four years when the Wright brothers uh, flew in Paris until World War I, a little short period of time. Every one of them was an impressionable child during that time period. Okay. I'm going to show you what I think is the most impressive aircraft. Most impressive means that seemingly impossible. How in the hell do we do that? And it's got the best performance that you could imagine. First flown in 1963, only 14 years after that first little P-80. 
And when it got too rusty to fly in 98, we stopped flying them and retreated to an airplane that was done in the 50s. The most impressive spaceship, I think, will always, to me, be the most impressive uh, manned spaceship is the lunar lander. It was designed in 64, only three years after Gagarin. The preliminary design of that, which looks a lot like what you see here, three years after Gagarin. OK, um, there was not a customer request for this, Spaceship One. When I thought I could do it, I was going to do it even if I didn't have the money to do it. And fortunately, I, I had a buddy who is worth $26 billion. So, so to him, it wasn't a big deal to, 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 sw to spend the money. I think it had a lot to do with what I saw as a child. And something else happened later. If you look at Allen, Musk, Bezos, Branson, Bigelow, and the Google guys, all of these guys took, took big money that they got in an unrelated thing from aerospace, you know, the internet boom and all that stuff. Well, you know where these guys got their money. They spent it on space because they were the, in that same age group during the Apollo years. Every one of them. We got to inspire our kids, guys. That's our future. We got to inspire them when they're that, when they're that young. Okay, very quickly, I'm going to go through this fast because you probably know most about it. Our spaceship program. There's our handsome pilots. One of them, who's our first astronaut, is too old to fly in the airlines. We wouldn't let him. We built our own B-52. This is like an X-15 program. We had to build our own B-52, a launch airplane. Uh, this is actually a pretty simple general aviation airplane with a, with a real throaty engine. Uh, it folded in half for reentry uh, because a good friend of mine in the 60s, Mike Adams, got killed when the X-15 didn't reenter at the right angle, and, and he got killed. And I'm thinking, hey, that's the big danger. I want something you can throw at the atmosphere upside down, and it'll straighten out. And so I decided to do this, even though I didn't have to. Uh, you're up here at 100 kilometers or so on Google Earth. And uh, this wandering around for an hour down here is uh, about 50% higher than the airliners fly. Okay. And then we finally get up to 55,000 feet, and you let the rocket go, and it goes up to your altitude and comes back and then circles for land. That's what the whole thing looked like. And that, that is, uh, 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 what is the big, uh, by Seattle, the big uh, volcano mountain? I think that's Rainier. OK, the reason we stopped flying Spaceship One, I had task 22, was I wanted to fly it every Tuesday for five months. And the reason I picked that, it, was let, it would let me have my entire staff of my company be astronauts. So I didn't tell Paul Allen that, but I told him that it would demonstrate the robustness and it would demonstrate really good the direct operating cost of flying these. So when somebody picked it up uh, to build space tourism, they'd have a, they'd have a business example and I will have shown that it is safe enough, possibly. Okay. Uh, but the historian at the Air and Space Museum, as soon as we flew that, that first flight, before the X Prize, he wrote a letter and said, listen, uh, I think that's a historic artifact. We'll hang it in the Milestones of Flight Gallery, which is the most prestige place for an airplane to retire in the world. And we almost didn't fly the X Prize flights. Because you make a smoking hole with it, and then you don't have your legacy in the <laughs> you don't have your legacy in there. And $10 million is not worth a lot uh, to Paul, but somehow we talked him into flying two more flights. Uh, okay, what do you uh, 
I had Paul Allen and Richard Branson sitting either side of me with my Macintosh laptop in front of me in my living room the night before we flew the first non-government space flight. And I looked at them both and said, you're probably thinking about what to do next, aren't you? And they didn't want to admit it, certainly in front of each other. But I says, and you're probably thinking, what's a good schedule? And I says, I have absolutely no idea what you should do next year unless you tell me something. I don't know what you should do in five years unless you tell me something. And the thing I want you to tell me is you're 10 years younger than me. I want you to tell me that on your deathbed 40, 45 years from now, what do you want to see accomplished? And if you can tell me what you want to see, I can draw an entire schedule back and tell you what to do next year. And I can tell you what you better get done in five years. But unless I have a goal out there, the moon landing was a real simple goal, right? And we did some phenomenal stuff because we had a goal that was specific. It wasn't like this, what is this big rocket NASA's doing now? They have a schedule for it, right? The space launch system thing, the huge rocket. And they add a year to the schedule every year. Bottom line, they don't have a schedule for it, right? But anyway, uh, I wanted them to tell me what they wanted to see. And uh, they looked like deer in the headlights. And I realized, and I thought, you guys were visionaries. What, what? And they said, well, I really haven't thought about it, but I'll get back to you, right? So anyway, I went to the next slide on my laptop, and I showed them what I thought would be cool. And I'm going to die 10 years earlier, but I want to see adjacent resort hotels in orbit. The reason they're adjacent, it takes no, essentially no energy to go back and forth between the two. One of them is the Von Braun ring. It's turning, so you got a tenth of a G or maybe more. And the other one is weightless. So that's where you want to put in the golf courses and the, and the stuff. And, you, and of course, there's a hemisphere dome, so you don't have to be in a spacesuit when you're outside, essentially. Uh, and you could go back and forth. And that should be, I, I want to see that happen while I'm alive. Now, how many of you here have been on ocean cruises? OK. Uh, how many here? didn't take the most expensive shore excursion because it cost too much. Well, the shore excursion for this vacation is you get in a vehicle that has no landing gear, no wings, no thermal protection. All it, it's a balloon with a rocket on it and a little bit of fuel. And you burp yourself so that you can get past that point where you fall towards the moon, right? And you do another little burp. So every three days or so, maybe two days, you spend a lot of time way out here in the, in the apogee of that ellipse around the moon, where you're looking at the moon and the Earth at the same time, the same window. You're looking at both of them. Cool, huh? <laughs> and then every couple of days, you're at 7,000 miles an hour, 100 feet over the highest mountain on the moon because there's no atmosphere, and you can do that. And it scares the shit out of you. <laughs> right? And I thought, you know, do, do a few of those and then come back to transfer into these things, finish your vacation, and go home. So I thought, that's kind of a cool thing. I, you know, I had to pick something, right? <laughs> So I told those guys that that's what I want to see before I die. And I drew a schedule for it, but I'm behind it already. OK, I'm going to talk about lessons learned. I'm almost done here. These are lessons that I learned from 50 years of research airplane uh, deployments. Informal chats like we're having here under the wing of the Defiant at Oshkosh. We didn't have internet in those days. But informal chats are more effective than formal meetings. Here's an informal chat. Just after Mike had the tail stall in Spaceship One, he jumped out of the airplane. This was a half an hour before our formal debrief for it. 
But what we were learning right there, you can see the hand signals and whatever, was the best thing. I worked for Jim Beatty for a year or two back in the early 70s. And here's a test pilot, Les Bourbon, who uh, getting into the BD-5. And the crew chief is pointing up, and I'm pointing sideways. That's an informal chat. I have no idea what we were saying, but I think that was an important meeting. <laughs> uh, seek out the experience, a lesson learned. Learn from the experienced. Conrad Donovan, one of the paperclip German engineers, coming out and looking in our rocket nozzle after our first space flight. You know, these, these guys are, are really smart. You know, nobody will hire them anymore because they're in their 80s, right, and 90s. Well, most of them are gone now. Uh, oh, this is cool. Do you, do you know who Max Faget is? He's a guy that in the uh, 50s and 60s turned out to be a, a, a brilliant creative designer. This idea of the shape of the mercury capsule where you have this dome and a low CG and that takes all the heat and if you throw it at the atmosphere upside down it'll straighten by itself and re-enter. Super idea, right? He invented that. He then designed the shape of the Gemini capsule and the Apollo capsule. He does not have a college degree. He's a high school guy. Okay. So anyway, uh, I had worked with him on other things uh, 15 years earlier, but I called him before we were going to roll out and unveil Spaceship One. And on that rollout, we put it in feather and put it out and fired the, the thrusters that, that maneuver it in space and everything. I'm mean, ready to fly. I said, Max, I've got a new idea for reentry, and you're the world's most creative guy on that. I want you to come out to this rollout and tell me whether this thing will work. And he says, I'm in my, I'm in my 80s now. I, 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 I don't travel anymore. I said, Max, what do you plan to do with the rest of your life? The day later, his daughter called and said, I'm bringing him. <laughs> and it was so cool to have Max Faget looking at my feathered reentry idea. And unfortunately, he died before he, he got to see the space flights. But uh, that was cool having him there. OK, experience, learn from them. We're about ready to fly the Voyager around the world. And you know, that takes a lot of paperwork and approvals from many nations, right? Well, this guy showed up. Anybody here recognize who he is? Wrong way, Corrigan. <laughs> after, after Charles Lindbergh, he said to everybody, oh, I'm going to fly to Los Angeles from New York. And he got lost, he claims, and he flew to Europe. And he didn't have to do any approvals at all. <laughs> So he was advising us on what to do with Voyager. <laughs> Involve your family in your successes at work. Okay? Tanya, here, wave at everybody, Tanya, is the only person to be in the back seats of Spaceship One in flight. Well, we were delivering it to show at Oshkosh on a way to put it in the Air and Space Museum, you know, hooked to the White Knight. And we landed in, uh, where was it, in, in Wisconsin, Madison, okay. And they thought it would be cool if Bert Rutan got in there, so when it landed at Oshkosh, I would open the door and get out and wave, you know. Okay, that was a plan. So I got in, and Tanya was standing right there. And... Uh, and I looked in the back, and yeah, we had put the seat belts back in after the X Prize flights, right? And I said, why don't you just get the teddy bear and get in? So she hopped in, and but standing next to her were Mike Melville's wife, who was up in the White Knight. And they had a co pilot, and they had an empty seat. And she says, get a ladder. So if I'd have called home, and the lawyers got into it, they obviously would have said no, but we had a five place 
uh, six, including the uh, teddy bear uh, flight into Oshkosh, which was kind of cool. Uh, anyway, involve the, involve the family. Uh, if you do really cool things that are so cool that they go on the covers, you don't have to buy advertising. <laughs> and advertising is a lot better to have on the cover than on the 42nd page, right? So do really cool things, and you'll never have to market it. OK, thank you very much. Um, I don't know what time we have for questions, but I'm happy to do it. So I know some of you have to go catch buses to go, um, so feel free. We're gonna take a few minutes and have some questions for Bert. And if you have a question you wanna ask, I'd like you to come up to one of the microphones onto the side, okay? He's got some. Oh, I got some, yeah. Somebody have a question? Yeah. Hey there. I know that there's been a push for efficiency in commercial air over performance, and we haven't had a uh, supersonic commercial airline for years now. What are your thoughts on when we'll see supersonic commercial air again? Uh, I think the C word has a lot to do with this. It's called uh, competition. There was competition during the development phase. Russians built TU-244 or whatever it was, 144. America built a mock-up of the Boeing uh, supersonic transport. Lockheed, Lockheed did a design. And of course, Concorde. Only one went into service. On the first passenger flight of the Concorde, it had a certain community noise level. There was sound around the airport. It had a certain cruise speed, a certain range. It had all the performance numbers. And decades later, when the Concorde was too rusty to fly and it was taken out of service, it had exactly the same community noise level, maximum speed and range. Bottom line, if you have competition, then you fight for market share and your product gets a lot better and you can have less community noise less operating costs, higher speed, more range of water, because you have competition. The fact that Con Concorde never had competition meant that it was stagnated, and it meant that as soon as these airplanes get too old, it isn't going to happen. And I'm not a big one for starting a, a supersonic transport, because uh, guys say that, well, we can, it's, yeah, it's more expensive, but we can get to the meeting and do the handshake and sign the uh, contract before our competition, and that, that'll pay for our whole flight, flight operation, right? Well, duh. How long is it gonna take until we have uh, virtual reality where you can't distinguish between what you see and what you hear and the feel of a handshake? Right. How long is it going to be until you can do that without going somewhere? It's not very long, right? So there's no need to travel fast. Uh, I think we'll do 100 times more traveling uh, 20, 20, 25 years from now than we do. We'll take 100 times more vacations, but we won't have to leave home. Next question. <coughs> sure. Uh, First, I wanted to say, Bert, uh, thanks for coming. Don't stop talking. Uh, when I was in sixth grade, I, my father worked for um, Honeywell, and he worked on the Mercury Mariner and the Apollo program. Cool. And um, I went to school with a Was he having set of, fun? Oh, he was having did, a great did, time. Did he work, and he, he, he made my really life. Hard? Well, yeah, he worked hard. Yeah. He definitely worked hard. Okay. And, and so, uh, you know, as a result of that, I went to college and I got to work for NASA for a while at Langley and Ames. I worked on the uh, F-22, the F-16. How old were you on the uh, Apollo landing in 69? 
I was probably about um, seventh or eighth grade. Okay, you're in the range. And it, it really made a difference in my life. And I, I guess my I, I'm trying to get to a question here, but um, you're doing good. <laughs> I even I even worked for a, a dean who was an astronaut. So it's um, you know NASA has really made a difference in my life. And uh, I guess what do you th see as NASA's future? Uh, night before last, I put in a report. Uh, actually, I'm allowed to say this to Newt Gingrich. Anybody know who that is? This is a guy. Uh, that asked me for my input on what uh, what should happen this next seven this next seven years. Why would he pick seven years? I guess it's two administrations, right? Because the boss wants to do something that that not only is great but looks great, and you can't do that with NASA. Uh, it's impossible. Just compared to what Musk did with his own money on Falcon Heavy and what NASA's done in the last whatever, it's clear you can't do it with NASA. How do you do it then? How do you do something that's 60s like in importance and excitement to show our kids the thing we need to show them so that we'll be making America really great decades later, okay? And so I, I put in a report and uh, I, I worked with four different experts to help me on that. Really smart people. And to a man, everyone said that, that you, can't, you essentially can't do anything with NASA. You need to take that money and do this with it. NASA still has the same budget they did when they were flying five shuttles. So what are they doing with that extra money? I don't think, I, NASA, I'm a big fan of what NASA did in the 60s, but, but I am horrified by what's gone on there the uh, last few decades. Just horrified. And I'm not talking about knowing about it because of what I read in the papers, but I'm, I'm very good friends with, with uh, Retired now, but but uh, NASA managers and NASA administrators. So I hate to say it, and I will say it public. I used to didn't because, uh, you know, my company still does NASA contracts. You know, but but you know that's how I feel about it. So I'm, you know, the older the older you get, the more you don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> so expect my talks will get better. Do Do you have a do you have a favorite center? I mean, if you look at the various JPL. centers. Yeah, I knew you were going to say that. Yeah, JPL, sure. Which is an FFRDC. They run uh, yeah. their shop similar yeah. to the Department of Energy. Well, they've certainly done great things. Uh, the, uh, the only project that they didn't do directly, that's, that's uh, uh, planetary exploration, was New Horizons. And... Uh, to explore P Pluto. New Horizons has 50 gram carbon fiber piece about that big autoclave piece from Spaceship One on it as it flew by Pluto and I thought that was kind of cool. And that's not a decision that NASA would have made. Because they really didn't like what I did. And they don't like what Musk is doing. Uh, other questions? First of all, I just want to say thank you um, for coming down today. That was excellent. But I am curious of the list of aviation innovators that you put up there, which two did you not meet? Uh, Korolev, uh, no, no Americans ever met him. The Russians hid him uh, until 67 when he died. Uh, he, he wasn't even known to the Russians until after he died. Isn't that weird? The von Braun of, of Russia during the, during the space race to go to the moon. And, and he, was, he was brilliant. He did just, just the same things that von Braun did. They were worried about us 
sneaking in and killing him, I guess. Uh, I'm just guessing. I, I don't know. But, but unfortunately, we didn't know about Korolev. And the other one was Howard Hughes. And I don't make apologies for not being able to meet Howard Hughes. But it was really cool to meet Jack Northrup and, and Ed Heinemann and, and uh, Kelly Johnson, of course, and Von Braun. Uh, I consider that I was born in a pretty good time period to be able to meet these folk and, uh, and to have fun. Also, if I had been born 12, uh, 12 or 14 years earlier, I would have died in my 50s uh, just because of advances in medicine. So I'm, I'm thinking that's a pretty good time to be born, right? <laughs> Although if I die and then you guys find out that there's extraterrestrial intelligence, I'll be really pissed off because I missed it. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. All right. First of all, thanks for coming here. But my question is that you've worked on a lot of uh, sort of first projects where they haven't been done before. And how do you generally figure out how long things will take when they haven't been, nobody's done something similar before? You know, I go down to the shop and work with the people. I don't sit in an office. I don't have a business card that says president, right? I realize if they're having fun, and if I go down and work my butt off, they will try to work harder than me to impress me because I pay them. <laughs> and by letting them have fun, which I think is number one priority, my employees have fun. I get many times the productivity than you would in an environment like you'd find at Cessna or Boeing, okay? Number two priority, and I always said this to my equity owners who owns the stock in the company, which is now Northrop, right? Number two priority is that my employees' families have fun. That's why I always had better health, dental, and vision care than Boeing or Lockheed had, okay? And that's why we did profit sharing. We, we pay people well. Of course, you've got to be paid well to live in the high desert. It's not a very pretty place. But, but I wanted their families to have fun because I know if their families are going to have fun, they're not going to be stressed out and they'll work hard. The number three priority, and I say this to every equity owner, and that is to make a profit this quarter. I don't think it's important. And the reason I don't is any company that goes bankrupt, you can look earlier and find out they stopped having fun. Thank you.